El Nino is a natural weather phenomenon in the tropical Pacific Ocean that is marked by warmer than average temperatures. That being said, the World Health Organization has warned about a potential global surge in viral diseases linked to this weather phenomenon. So what are the viral diseases linked to El Nino? What are their common symptoms and treatment procedures? And what are the prospects of these diseases triggering a new pandemic? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we address prospects of a surge in viral disease outbreaks amid the presence of El Nino. For more on this, I have Dr. Kim Sing Tech from Institute Pasteur Korea here in the studio. Dr. Kim, it's been a while. Welcome back. Good afternoon. I also have Professor Sanjaya Sinanayake at the Australian National University. Professor Sinanayake, welcome back. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Right, Dr. Kim, let's begin then with some examples of the viral diseases linked to El Nino. Well, uh, there is uh, even just uh, some uh, scientific report that uh, just uh, showing uh, some strong connection between the uh, some this uh, El Nino and also the, uh, the outbreak of uh, infectious disease. So it, this infectious disease include not only just the viral disease, but also some other infectious disease, including like uh, well cholera and then Zika and then uh, chikungunya, dengue and then Rift Valley fever. There are many, and uh, well actually there are some uh, climate anomalies regarding this El Nino, and then the, those things are. Uh, we are interested in the uh, some uh, increased rainfall and then just uh, warmer temperatures, especially on the sea surface and the land surface. The reason why we are actually just concerned about this is that, for example, is uh, by by just uh, increased rainfall. This actually makes a very just a very favorable just condition, especially for just a mosquito just breeding just uh, the size. It ultimately, this could just uh, just lead to just uh, the spreading this uh, more like uh, some uh, factor like a uh, mosquito just born diseases. I see. And speaking about mosquitoes, Dr. Mm. Kim, scientists have warned that climate change are allowing, is allowing, that is, mosquitoes to grow faster mm -hmm. and live longer. Could you tell us a bit more about the implications of that reality mm -hmm. on us? All right. So as I just told you, uh, there are two main just, uh, climate aspects. It's the, the increase of the rainfall and then the higher temperatures. And that actually affects the, uh, some, uh, the insects uh, development and then the behavior and then this all the uh, distribution. For, and uh, for number one aspect is the uh, warmer temperature. That actually just, in, but mosquito actually just uh, uh, the, the develop faster. So the mosquito larvae actually faster, develop the faster into the, uh, some adult larvae. And then once that actually developed, then the especially just adult uh, female mosquito now just uh, starts to that's, uh, much sooner the bite much sooner and also much just frequently. So actually that actually just somehow leads to the some uh, spreading of just uh, this mosquito-borne disease. And also other things is uh, actually by just uh, the weather, uh, the increase, just the higher temperature actually helps to expand the new territory for the mosquitoes. That actually just one of the other factor that uh, the one of the, the main factor, and also the uh, some uh, rainfall. As I told you, that actually increased the uh, the number of just potential the breeding size of the mosquitoes. That actually somehow combined the just ultimately affect the uh, all those uh, development and then all the patterns of uh, the diseases are spread. Right, I see. Professor Sineake, the 2015 to 2016 El Nino reportedly unleashed rampant outbreaks of disease across the globe. Are we likely to witness a similar scenario, do you think? Uh, yes, look, it is possible. And it is hard to know. There's definitely an association between climate change, El Nino, and these disease outbreaks. It's trying to tease out causation, whether it's directly causing it or whether there are other factors related to it that might be involved, we have to keep thinking about. But certainly during the last El Nino, there were reports in South America of more malaria, of more cholera, which is a bacterial, not a viral infection, in India and uh, Bangladesh, and more dengue in the Pacific Islands. And just uh, following on from what Dr. Kim said, mosquitoes are important because 80% of the global population are at risk of at least one vector-borne infection. By a vector, I mean uh, an insect like a mosquito or maybe a tick. And it also, more mosquitoes kill people every year than people kill people every year. So very, very nasty. And in terms of uh, other things we have to think about, in related to infections is that the changes you can see with climate change, including uh, droughts, 
floods and famines that can impact on people's nutrition and you can have malnourished people at increased risk of infections because their immune system isn't as strong as it normally would be. And I also just want to touch on a study uh, which was published in February this year by the Royal Society. They, uh, the researchers looked at 118 years of mosquito or Anopheles mosquito, the malaria-causing species of mosquito data, 118 years in Africa. And they showed that every year the mosquitoes' territory would expand 6.5 metres upwards and about four kilometres southwards. And while they couldn't prove it, they suggested climate change was involved. So that does support the fact that these mosquitoes that can cause diseases are moving because of climate change. Right, I see. Meanwhile, Professor Sinene uh, Dr. Kim mentioned dengue fever as you did earlier. Now, I understand there is no vaccine, no cure with regard to dengue fever. That being said, what are its symptoms and how is it normally treated? Yes, dengue is a, a very widespread infection found on most continents and it can cause a, a lot of trouble. So it's transmitted by a mosquito and the classical symptoms are uh, a severe headache, typically behind the eyes, fevers, muscle aches and pains. You can also get a rash and it's in its most severe form, your blood pressure can drop, you can have bleeding and death. So that is dengue. And there are four different types of the dengue virus and having infection with one type doesn't protect you from infection with the other. There is no specific anti-drug, there's no antiviral or antibiotic, uh, so an antiviral we have for COVID, we don't have that for dengue, antibiotics we have for bacteria, we don't have for dengue. But we do have a vaccine now, um, the brand name's I think Dengvaxia, and it's a, a live virus, so a live vaccine, so it's got less powerful forms of the virus in the vaccine, and it can be given to people aged between six and about 45 if they are at high risk of dengue. So that is something that's promising, but you have to have had dengue before you have the vaccine, otherwise you can have some serious side effects. Right, I see. And speak about the vaccine, uh, Professor Sinanayaki, is it just one shot or two shots? Now, off the top of my head, I think it's three shots over about 12 months, but it's certainly more than, than one shot. And of course, because we, we have got a vaccine, but it can only be given to certain people and we don't have drugs that specifically cure it, it's very important uh, for doctors to be thinking about dengue when they see someone so they can watch them closely because dengue responds very well to intensive care and monitoring. So there are good outcomes. And of course, prevention. So if you have stagnant pools of water around your house in uh, containers or tires, et cetera, getting rid of them will reduce the chance of the dengue carrying mosquitoes being in your area. Right, I see. And having spoken about the dengue fever, do Zika, prof uh, Dr. Kim, and the chikungunya lead to similar symptoms? Well, the uh, dengue and the Zika and the chikungunya, I mean, mostly, uh, in many just the proportions, is that they actually cause uh, asymptomatic or just a mild disease. That's for the main part. And then the interesting thing is that the, the name of the, those viruses actually imply uh, some uh, the symptoms. The, uh, for example, like a dengue is a local word. Actually, they uh, in, just uh, suggest a seizure or a cramp. So dengue fever sometimes also just uh, we, we say the breaking bone fever. And then the Zika, Zika actually does not represent any just a specific symptom. Zika actually represents the, uh, the, the forest where the, uh, the, this virus was first isolated in the Uganda, Africa. And for the chikungunya, this uh, bent over in pain. It's extreme just the joint pain it involves. So it's a, a initial symptom is kind of just uh, uh, ambiguous because uh, very similar. And then the thing is, uh, the, and also that's why the diagnosis is very just important. And then the interesting aspects of these uh, three different 
different viruses is that there are specific the mosquitoes that actually can transmit these viruses. They are called the Aedes aegypti and the Aedes albopictus. And then this Aedes albopictus, uh, this mosquito is also just uh, is exists also in the Korea, but we do not see any just uh, I mean just uh, the any just uh, our just, own, just uh, any specific just uh, transmission in Korea so far. And then the uh, uh, so in terms of the symptoms, if it is uh, very severe. Well, for example, I have to tell about the, uh, some Zika because uh, Zika, even just uh, before a year uh, 2015, the Zika was actually uh, identified uh, uh, around the 1940s in Africa, the Uganda, the Zika forest. But then the, this caused usually just asymptomatic or very mild symptoms. But after the, uh, the, we, the first report of the uh, uh, very severe the, the Zika outbreak was actually year two, uh, the 2015 in the Brazil and other territories. And then they reported very severe so the neurologic uh, disease. Probably you remember the microcephaly is a birth defect. And also some uh, Guillain-Barre syndromes, which is also another type of uh, just a neurological disease. So that's why the, uh, once the, the WHO actually declared the, the fact of public health, public health interest of international concern, something like that. And also the chikungunya viruses, uh, the, if it is just very severe, as I told you, as this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the name it implies the very severe joint pain, especially some extremity, extremities. Right. Professor Sunanyake, are there any other diseases that we need to be wary about during the hot and humid summer? Look, I, I think we have to be worried about, with regard to infections, emerging infections. So really in the last 50 years, we've had about 50 new infections appear. Many, have, many of them, or most of them, have been from the animal world, which have entered the human world. And of course, uh, we all know about uh, COVID. So although COVID was the first pandemic, in a true pandemic in 100 years, we do have these new infections appearing all the time. And if there are droughts, if there's less food about for animals, less water for animals, we'll find that animals will potentially start coming closer to human habitats where they can access food and water. And that proximity of humans and animals is what allows the transmission of these infections to occur. So that's something we have to think about. So new infections that could cause pandemics. And although Dr. Kim and I are here to talk about infections, it is worth noting that with the warmer temperature, there have it has been associated with increased levels of mental illness, suicides, admissions to hospital with psychiatric illnesses. Part of it may be uh, because of the inability or the effects of some medications on the body's ability to regulate heat. But that's something we have to think about as well. Right, I see. And, and staying with that, Professor Sinanayake, is that something that you have been observing there in Australia? Look, not specifically in Australia. It's not something that I've seen or looked closely into as an infectious diseases physician, but it is certainly something I have been aware about uh, when talking about climate change and the potential effects that this has been mentioned more than once. So it's not just infections, it's, it's other things as well. Right, I see. Meanwhile, Dr. Kim, what are the prospects of these weather-related viral diseases triggering uh, a global situation similar to that of the pandemic? Well, actually, even just before the COVID-19 pandemic, WHO actually just identified, I think, probably 10 potential just the, the pathogens which could just cause some future outbreaks or just pandemic. And many of them actually belong to some hemorrhagic fever viruses and also some respiratory viruses, for example, including MERS-CoV and then SARS-CoV. And, and also, uh, they also uh, just included the Zika virus. And also, lastly, they included disease X because uh, that is not known uh, at that moment. But uh, now we know that the disease X at the moment is, uh, is, uh, is actually COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. So the, one of the reasons they actually included the Zika virus is that the Zika virus is unlike uh, other just uh, viruses that I talked about, is uh, transmitted by the, uh, the mosquitoes. And so regarding uh, this uh, the climate change we, we are just talking about, the, uh, this mosquito-borne just uh, uh, viral disease has, I think has uh, some uh, potential to be just uh, spread further, especially uh, not only just confined to the uh, 
some uh, Africa, was the South America, and then South Eastern, South Eastern Asia. Uh, with the uh, some increasing temperatures, there the uh, territory of this uh, mosquito is habitat is actually just increasing the further to the, the north and the south. So the, with that, uh, because now just uh, the vector, the mosquitoes now their territories increases, which means actually the uh, the potential for like a mosquito borne disease, uh, the chance of mosquito borne disease actually just increasing as well. Right, I see. Professor Sidenayakin, speaking about the pandemic, COVID-19, it has been reported that one person is dying from COVID-19 every four minutes, I hear. How do you explain this finding and how concerned should we be? Yes, thank you, Sunny. And I'll ju probably just add on to what uh, Dr. Kim was saying, give an example in Australia that Japanese encephalitis has now been seen in very more southern parts of Australia, like uh, New South Wales, Victoria, and we attribute that to more mosquitoes because of floods and and more rain. So climate change, we think, has, or climate changes have impacted on that. Uh, but going back to your question about COVID, Look, there's probably a COVID death every four minutes or so, as you're saying, but you have to put this into perspective. At the peak of our severe COVID uh, last year in February 2022 and made the year before that, February 2021, we were seeing about 100 and uh, 60 deaths every four minutes instead of, uh, or 40 deaths every four minutes instead of uh, one death every four minutes. So we were seeing a lot more then. Now, this doesn't mean that one death every four minutes is inconsequential, but it does show that COVID has changed in the way that it's interacting with humans due to our hybrid immunity. The fact that many of us have both had COVID and have been vaccinated, we are still getting infected, but we're less likely to have severe disease. And of course, COVID isn't going anywhere. It's likely to become established as one of our typical respiratory viruses. It's still being seen in all seasons in temperate climates like Australia, but it seems to be becoming more of a typical respiratory virus, uh, making most of its impact in winter. But certainly, yes, there are still deaths. Yes, we must take COVID seriously, make sure our vaccines are up to date, get tested if we think we have it. But it's much less than the death rate that we were seeing earlier on in the pandemic. And, and staying with that, uh, Professor Nenayake, this is an impromptu question. Do you suppose the world has learned quite a bit from the pandemic itself? I mean, has it prepared us for a future pandemic? Yes, look, I, I think we have learned a lot, but it's just so much information that we have learned over the last three years, which has been captured on TV, on social media, in documents, in, in data sets all over the world. I think we all have to sit down as health professionals and actually go through that. At the end of every outbreak, even if it's a a, a diarrhea outbreak at your local restaurant where there were two or three cases of salmonella. Even at the end of that outbreak, everyone sits down and goes through the outbreak process and sees what they could have done better and what the lessons were that they've learned. We have to do that globally for COVID, and that won't take a day or two. That may take many months, but it is important that we do it because, as Dr. Kim and I have said, the next pandemic with maybe with disease X, is just around the corner. Right, indeed. And Dr. Kim, the WHO mm. says there's been a 63% surge in zoonotic disease outbreaks in Africa over the past decade, uh, from 2012 to 2022. Mm -hmm. First of all, for the layperson like myself, do tell us a bit about zoonotic diseases and should we be taking tangible action in response to this reality? Well, the main reason for the uh, this uh, sudden, sudden increase of this uh, genetic uh, disease is that uh, now we have uh, more frequent uh, just uh, chances of just uh, uh, in, just uh, 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 contacting just a uh, wildlife reservoir, and then most of this is more mainly due to just uh, human just uh, behavior. It's uh, urbanization and the deforestation that actually facilitates just uh, more chances of just a uh, contact between wildlife reservoir and then just uh, just uh, humans. So that's why. And then for the uh, maybe some. Uh, 
the, the things that we can actually prepare, I mean, in, in response to all this pre prevention to the uh, some genetic diseases, that there are some uh, couple of things that we can think about. Just first of all is uh, maybe the, some uh, smart some surveillance system to identify some high threat, just group of such pathogen, which including some identifying some hotspots of so those are just uh, the pathogen, also improving some uh, methodologies. And the second one is uh, so all those uh, all things about some preparedness and then translation research. That includes actually so developing some uh, sort of just a broad spectrum antivirals and also uh, some uh, new uh, uh, platform technology. So for example, we actually our we have a very successful experience in the COVID-19 pandemic. This is uh, mRNA, just the, the platform that 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 uh, uh, did, although this is uh, the vaccine for others like uh, some uh, even for therapeutics, we can think about some other alternative just the uh, platform technology to cope with. The certain just outbreak very just uh, fastly. And then the third, the third one is maybe just reducing the uh, some uh, drivers of a spillover and then spreading. So the, as I said, uh, there are some many just uh, there are some more chances of just uh, contacting be contact between the wild drive reservoir and then the human just the humans. So, and then the, the thing is that we have to do in this regard is uh, minimizing the chance of just uh, contacting between just uh, human, humans and the wild right reservoir. And also one of the things is that maybe we can just uh, diminish just a trade of just a wild right animals and also the, the pro products of, uh, from these animals as well. Right, of course. Mm. Professor Sinanayaki, there has been a surge in travel post-pandemic. And, and that being said, Professor, what safety measures do you advise? So if, if people are traveling overseas, it's, uh, well, there's going to be frantic activity after three years of inactivity due to COVID and closed borders, et cetera. Normally, at least a billion people cross international borders every year, which actually is another reason we see pandemics occur because new diseases spread so quickly in large numbers because of overseas travel. Now, a lot of the travel we, we see uh, people, certainly here in Australia, are what we call VFR in infectious diseases and travel health, which is visiting friends and relatives. So people who've migrated from one country go back regularly to catch up with friends and relatives. But what happens there, it's quite different to a tourist going to a country or a region to which they've never been before. They'll often be very cautious in that setting and make sure they're having appropriate vaccines, they're taking malaria prophylaxis as they need it, etc. But when people visit friends and relatives from a country they came from originally, they don't do that. And we not uncommonly see people come back with typhoid fever from Asia, malaria from Africa uh, for, for these reasons. So I always tell people, even if you're going to visit friends and relatives, Remember that your immunity now from the country from which you came may have disappeared for infections like malaria, uh, for typhoid, for gastrointestinal bacteria that give you diarrhea. So be cautious, get your vaccines, watch the sources of water and food that you drink. And if you need malaria prophylaxis, use it because you don't want to get malaria. Because a lot of people in countries where malaria is endemic because they've got immunity if they get malaria they're not too sick but people who haven't been to those countries for a long time may not be so immune to malaria then they get really sick when they get another episode so right, that's what indeed. i would suggest to right very valid point right there professor sinanayake well that that's all the time we have for this edition professor as always thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today and thank Dr. you kim here in the studio thank you very much yeah. for your insights thank you. Right, well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Issues and Insiders. Do join us again same time tomorrow, that is Friday.